WGTN headquarters in Beijing. This is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. You know, many friends wrote me emails and text me on social media asking about our program, The Hub, and about our channel, CGTN. They're like, are you mostly following the official narrative? Um, are you representing the global south? How would you compare yourselves with, for example, the Western mainstream media? Well, there's no easy answer to that question. But the fact is, if you have watched their program long enough, you'll find that we have a wide scope of shows and a diverse range of guests since its inception six months ago. And today is no exception. Joining me in our program at this hour is Benjamin Norton. He's the founder and editor of the independent news website Multipolarista, where he does original reporting in both English and Spanish. He reported from numerous Latin American countries, and he was a former investigative journalist at the Gray Zone. Benjamin, great to have you with us. Welcome to CGTN. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Benjamin, um, first of all, you know, there are so many things I want to get to, but first of all, how would you describe the voice, the representation of the global South in the global media and the opinion landscape? Uh, are you happy with the state of affairs now? Well, clearly we see that in the Western media, there is a lot of bias and the presentation of the Global South in the Western media is very propagandistic. So first of all, the Western media acts as though the Global South is largely irrelevant. I mean, when we're talking about the conflicts in Ukraine, the U.S. government constantly talks about the idea of the so-called international community in scare quotes. And when it says that, it really means the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Australia and New Zealand. Maybe they'll throw in Japan and South Korea, but they ignore the vast majority of the global population, which is in the global South. And we see that, that same bias reflected in the Western media. And furthermore, when there is coverage of the Western media, there's often a kind of racist patronizing perspective that portrays countries in the global South as authoritarian, in scare quotes, and portrays the West as supposedly democratic in counterbalance against the global south. And unfortunately, what it really shows is that despite the fact that these Western powers claim that they ended colonialism several decades ago, that colonialist mentality still very much lives on, especially in the media. You know, we're living in the age of social media and the digital media. Um, so in the age of social media and personalized news feeds you see everywhere, thanks to big data, do you think people in different countries, especially between the West and the rest, are better able to hear one another or less able? Well, technology is a double-edged sword. There's always good things and bad things about any given new technology. And one of the good things about social media and other websites is that it's made it possible for us to communicate with people around the world. I'm speaking to you all from Latin America and you know there are people around the world doing interviews with people on the other side of the planet. That's incredible. But at the same time, there's negative aspects of all of these technologies. And one of the negative aspects of social media is that, we, we, that we've seen that it's been politicized and used by the US government to advance its strategic foreign policy interests. So the US claims that it supposedly supports freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but we see that more and more there is censorship and manipulation and control of these social media platforms by Western governments, especially by the U.S. government. We see that the U.S. government says that Russians and Chinese people and Iranians and Nicaraguans and Venezuelans are not able to express their views on these platforms. And instead, we see that more and more only people who support the U.S. government narrative are actually allowed to speak truthfully and if you criticize NATO, if you criticize the war in Syria, you could be suspended, you could be censored. So there are ways in which social media has helped us to communicate and be more interconnected, but there's also ways in which that the US government and Silicon Valley have used these technologies to increase their control over society. You know, speaking of which, Ben, it's very interesting because I think the West is exercising a softer version of censorship, if you will. Uh, we saw Twitter labeling Chinese state media um, journalists as, you know, state-affiliated media journalists. They labeled uh, people like myself, uh, my colleagues, including Liu Xin. Uh, on YouTube, they're taking down 
RT America, they're, they're shutting down RT America rather, and they're taking down Russia and Chinese networks. Absolutely, and we've seen the same thing against Iranian media outlets, which have all been erased from Western social media platforms. It shows that the US government claims to support freedom of speech, but what it really means is only freedom of speech within a very narrow margin. As long as you don't criticize Western foreign policy, as long as you don't criticize NATO, it's okay. But if you start criticizing the proxy war in Ukraine, the war on Yemen, the Israeli horrible oppression of the Palestinian people, then you'll face consequences. We've seen this again and again. And increasingly, the US government is not only doing this against foreigners, it's even doing this against its own citizens, against US citizens. The US claims to support freedom of speech, but we've seen that prominent journalists and people from the United States who criticize US government policy have been censored, have been erased. And all of this is part of an information war. The CIA director, William Burns, said in a testimony before the Senate this March, he said that the US government is waging an information war against Russia, and he boasted that Washington is winning that information war. Yeah, William Burns, I remember him well. He was the Deputy uh, Secretary of State uh, when I was in Washington as a journalist. Now, Ben, you reported from a list of very interesting countries, I would say. Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, Honduras, Colombia, among many other countries. And we know that nearly all of them were subject to U.S. regime change attempts uh, in the 20th century. Is it why you're there? Yeah, that's a big part of it. Uh, as a journalist, I focus on covering U.S. foreign policy and these issues that are ignored by the mainstream Western media, like roles in the U.S. role in coups, in regime change operations, and in imposing sanctions, which is a form of economic warfare. You mentioned some of the countries I've reported from, including Venezuela and Nicaragua. Both of these countries are under illegal US sanctions, which is a form of economic warfare. You also mentioned the role of the United States and specifically organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, or the US Agency for International Development, both of which are cutouts of the CIA. These organizations have played a key role in funding regime change attempts or coups, simply violent coup attempts in Latin America, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Bolivia. There was a successful coup in Bolivia in 2019 backed by the U.S. government. There was also a coup backed by the U.S. in Honduras in 2009. I've been reporting on these issues in Latin America, and of course, the mainstream media in the U.S. largely ignores these issues or if you speak about these issues, they smear you and say that you're supposedly a conspiracy theorist, even though we have so much evidence showing that the US government has for many decades carried out coups and regime change operations around the world, not just in Latin America. All right, let's talk about your latest uh, effort. Uh, you are running a news website called the Multipolarista. Some headline stories that I grabbed are, you know, include Pakistan's prime minister accuses U.S. diplomat of conspiracy to overthrow his elected government. And then on this website, uh, you also run a story that says sanctions violate human rights and should be lifted, says UN Human Rights Council. German EU official uses racist rhetoric, claiming Russians don't value life. And Venezuela's economy will grow 20% in 2022, despite illegal U.S. sanctions, predicts Western Bank. You know, obviously, these stories will not be heard in Western media. So what I'm really interested in asking you is why do you think Western media ignore these stories? Do you blame the Western reporters themselves who might be exercising, say, self-censorship? Or it is the, let's say, editorial environment they're in where they only pick certain stories, you know, where reporters feel obliged to go with the flow? Or maybe it's the Western audience who want to hear certain things from their reporters and their net networks? Well, all of those are factors, of course, but I think the most important reason is a structural problem with Western media outlets. And that structural problem is that they exist to reinforce the foreign policy interests of the governments in the country that they're situated in. We've seen over many decades with the war against Korea, the, the US war against Vietnam, both of the two US wars against Iraq, the war in Yemen, the war in Libya, the war in Syria, 
that these media outlets, they spread lies and disinformation on behalf of the U.S. government and through the mouths of anonymous U.S. intelligence officials from the CIA and other spy agencies. And those lies are used to try to justify those intentional those leaks, aggressive if you will, by the White House and the, the CIA and the like. A absolutely. We've seen so many cases of this, from the infamous example of the CIA claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and that was used to justify an illegal invasion of Iraq. So we see that the, the media plays a role as the handmaiden for the U.S. government, and also European media outlets play the same role for European governments. And they claim to be independent, but the reality is they're not independent. So the journalists who work there, they, have, they play a role, they bear responsibility, but they're not the ones who choose their stories frequently. Frequently, it's their editors who are the ones that decide what they can publish, and their editors will not allow them to publish certain stories if it rocks the boat. If it, it actually, in, in some cases, there's also the potential possibility that they will lose access, which is a huge part of it. And this leads to self-censorship, because if you're a reporter at the New York Times and you rely on the CIA to feed you stories, you're not going to criticize the CIA because then they might stop feeding you the stories that you publish. So we see this, this feedback loop where many of these Western media outlets are reliant on Western governments to feed them stories. So they're very reluctant to challenge those governments. Many would say this is a symbiotic relationship. Um, whether or not the Western reporters themselves would describe it that way or will own up to it. Um, ben, you produced a political podcast called Moderate Rebels. This is a really interesting term, moderate rebels. Is it what you think you yourself are? Well, it's a tongue-in-cheek name. I use that name because the U.S. government, when it supports these extremist groups around the world, it frequently refers to them as moderate rebels. It, the most infamous example of this was in Syria, where the CIA spent a billion dollars a year arming and training these groups, many of which were Islamist extremist groups that carried out sectarian crimes inside Syria, that many of which were linked to Al Qaeda. And the U.S. always insisted that it only supported the moderate rebels. So it's a tongue in cheek title for that name. And it reflects the kind of stories that I cover as a journalist, which is focused on uncovering the the dark side of U.S. foreign policy, which, again, is, of course, never going to be covered in mainstream media in the, Uni in the United States. We all know Noam Chomsky, a very um, respected and influential uh, left-wing scholar. In his famous book, Manufacturing Consent, he actually specified for the first time what he believes to be the propaganda model of the Western mainstream media through what he calls control mechanisms. They include, um, in case our viewers are not super familiar with this, number one, the interests of owners, number two, fierce competition to attract advertisers, number three, the symbiotic relationship between the journalists and their governments, government sources, and uh, other important sources, and number four, flax, which basically means a negative response such as lobbying efforts against the establishment uh, prevailing views. So Benjamin, how relevant do you think Chomsky's analyses are these days? Absolutely still relevant, maybe even more relevant than they were when he articulated them first a few decades ago. The reality is that we've seen all of those problems that Chomsky and Edward Herman discuss in their book get worse. In fact, we now know that in the United States, five corporations control over 90 percent of the news media. So more and more, these news outlets are being concentrated into the hands of a small group of elite oligarchs. A good, a good example of this is the Washington Post, which is one of the major newspapers in the United States. It belongs to Jeff Bezos. Bezos is one of the richest people in human history with an estimated wealth of $200 billion. He is the founder and the executive chairman of Amazon, one of the most powerful corporations in the world. And Amazon has contracts with the CIA, with the Pentagon, and with other U.S. government agencies. He is the owner of one of the main newspapers in the United States, which is also very closely linked to the U.S. government and the CIA in particular. That is just one example of these many conflicts of interest in the media in the United States, which is controlled by these billionaire oligarchs who have contracts with the U.S. government. So, of course, 
they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. This is truly insightful analysis. Um, it's a fact, in fact, uh, wherever and however you look at it. Um, I want to move on to talk about some of the issues of the day, Ben. So Ukraine, how would you describe the role of NATO and the U.S. in the ongoing war in Ukraine? Well, the reality is that the U.S. started the war in Ukraine, although this history has been erased. In the Western media discussion of Ukraine today, the media narrative is that Russia is this evil boogeyman that invaded Ukraine on February, in this, this February, to punish the people of Ukraine supposedly for being democratic. That is not at all the reality. The reality is that the U.S. started this war in Ukraine back in 2014 by organizing a coup, by backing a violent coup led by far-right extremists. And the top U.S. diplomat, Victoria Nuland, was recorded. There's a phone recording of her speaking to the U.S. ambassador, Jeffrey Payak, exactly. in which they discuss who the leaders of the post-coup Ukrainian government will be. And then they mention this guy, Yatsenyuk, who became the prime minister just a few days after the U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine. This created a civil war in Ukraine. And from 2014 until the beginning of this year, 14,000 Ukrainians died in that civil war, according to the United Nations. And the Ukrainian government, backed by NATO, was responsible for the majority of civilian casualties. So that history has been erased in the Western media, but you can't understand the conflict in Ukraine without understanding that history. Now, certainly, Russia does bear part of the blame for escalating the conflict by invading this February, but Russia did not start the war. It was the United States and NATO that started this war eight years ago and have continued escalating this war, sending billions of dollars of weapons and trying to escalate right on Russia's border, even threatening Russia with nuclear weapons, which is, of course, what pressured Russia to intervene militarily. And then the next question really is, what do you think global geopolitics will look like uh, should the war end in Ukraine? Will we see more blocks? camps of countries where they become more cohesive internally, but more antagonistic against each other? Well, what I'll say as a human being is I, I don't want to see that, but I think as a journalist speaking objectively, the unfortunate reality is that I think those blocks are going to become stronger and stronger. And why is that? Because the United States and the European Union have basically declared war on Russia. A former top State Department official named Elliot Cohen wrote an article in the Atlantic magazine admitting, boasting, that the U.S. and NATO are waging a proxy war on Russia via Ukraine. So the U.S. is waging a war on Russia. We also saw that the French finance minister boasted that Europe is waging a brutal economic war on Russia with some of the worst sanctions imposed on a country in history. So that is not going to end if Russia withdraws its military forces from Ukraine. The U.S. has already said that the sanctions are going to continue. And Joe Biden has made it clear the U.S. goal is regime change. They want to overthrow the Russian government. So what this means is that this is a war. This is a new Cold War. And unfortunately, the U.S. is also trying to draw China in and waging a new Cold War simultaneously on both Russia and China. And this is forcing countries around the world to pick a side. And the U.S. is threatening those countries, including its own allies, like, for instance, India. India wants to continue doing business with both Russia and the United States. But the U.S. has been telling India, you have to pick a side. India is also part of the anti-China alliance created by the U.S. called the Quad, which is aimed at trying to contain China in the, in the Pacific region. So unfortunately, we see that all of these policies are part of a larger overarching policy that the United States is waging of a new Cold War. And although many people around the world, the majority of the global population, are against this idea of a new Cold War, they don't want to go back to this idea that you have to pick one side between these two, these two different sides. But the unfortunate reality is that if you look at the aggressive policies of the US and the European Union, they're making it clear that as, as George Bush said, the U.S. president, you're either with us or you're against us. Yeah, that's, um, that was quite some time ago, but uh, you know, the, the words still echo um, until right now. Um, talking about the future of geopolitics, a big piece of the puzzle is U.S.-China relations. Uh, I want to go back to 2018 when Trump 
and his key allies in the White House launched the trade war against China first, which later evolved into what many believe to be a trade war plus, some call it a new Cold War against China, and Biden kept much of Trump's China policy intact. What do you think was the fundamental reason, or reasons perhaps, for America to antagonize China at this point in history? Well, it's very clear. In the 1990s, the Pentagon published an internal strategy called the Wolfowitz Doctrine. And in this strategy, the U.S. Defense Department says very explicitly that its goal is to prevent a near-peer strategic competitor in Eurasia from emerging. That is to say, translated into simpler language, the U.S. government will never tolerate a country that is of similar power politically, militarily, and economically. And now there is not only one, there are actually two, and they're allies, China and Russia. So this is why the U.S. is absolutely terrified and angry, infuriated, because the U.S. really sees the world as its imperial property. In the U.S., there's constantly this, this narrative that the U.S. is the so-called policeman of the world. And we've seen this reinforced in, in 2018 when the Pentagon published a new national defense strategy. And in this national defense strategy, the U.S. military said that its goal is so-called great power competition with China and Russia to prevent them from becoming competitors, to prevent them from having significant political and economic influence around the world. It, it is not hyperbole to say that the U.S. goal is to maintain unipolar hegemony over the entire planet, or as people in the Pentagon used to say, they use the term full spectrum dominance. That is the U.S. goal, full spectrum dominance. And that is why now the U.S. is waging economic war on both China and Russia. It is waging an information war against both China and Russia. And unfortunately, it has escalated to a military proxy war against Russia. I want to move on and talk about China's role in Latin America. Some politicians in Washington, especially many in the Trump administration, accuse China of doing neocolonialism in Latin America. Now, you've lived and reported in the region for quite a while. Is that what you see? No, it, it is ridiculous. And I have to say, this is a classic example of what psychologists refer to as projection. The Western colonialist powers, which committed genocide across the planet, which colonized the global south, they're now accusing their so-called competitor, China, of the same crimes that they themselves committed. It is an absolutely absurd example of hypocrisy and psychological projection. The reality is, is that the U.S. government considers Latin America to be its so-called backyard with this very colonialist rhetoric, or Joe Biden recently referred to Latin America as the U.S. front yard, but it still re reflects this very colonialist mentality that is ensconced in this, this idea, uh, embodied in this idea called the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. government claims it has for 200 years since the 1820s that Latin America is part of its so-called sphere of influence and no other major power is allowed to have bilateral relations with countries in Latin America. Now, if you actually listen to what people in Latin America have to say, they have a completely different view. A lot of people in Latin America, especially progressives and leftists, but even some people who are leaning to the right wing politically, they say, look, we have the right to have economic and political ties with China and Russia and Iran and India and any other power because we are not colonies. We are independent countries. And more and more in the region, we see people, not only the, the progressive anti-imperialist forces like in Latin America and in Venezuela, Nicaragua and Cuba, but also we see people like the Argentine president, who is a kind of center, center left president, Alberto Fernandez. He just took a historic trip to both China and Russia. And now Argentina, which is the third largest economy in Latin America, is becoming part of the Belt and Road Initiative. This is an example of how people in Latin America, even right-wing presidents, like the former president of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, are saying to Washington, look, we have independent foreign policy, we have our own economic interests, and we want to do business with countries like China and Russia. And by the way, the difference is, when we in Latin America, they say, when we do business with China, it actually helps to build infrastructure in the region. Whereas over 200 years of U.S. domination of Latin America, 
we've seen de-development as opposed to development of the region. Yeah, 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 obviously. The Western countries go to Latin America or Africa for, quote-unquote, international development, and China is going there, obviously, for neocolonialism. Now, finally, Ben, let's talk about you know, the rise of China. Many in the West fear China's rise. Let's face it, the perception against China among the Western citizens, residents, are getting increasingly negative. But despite the fact that China repeatedly said it does not seek global hegemony, um, how would you describe China's rise over the decades and its expanding role in the world? Well, objectively speaking, what China has accomplished economically is incredible. It is absolutely incredible and historic, lifting 800 million people out of absolute poverty, ending extreme poverty. That is an incredible accomplishment that everyone around the world should try to learn from. In, in the largest country on earth in terms of population. And that I think is one of the main reasons why there is so much negative propaganda about China in the West, because China has gone from what was partially a colonized country, partially colonized by the Western colonialist powers, just less than 100 years ago, and has become a global economic superpower, ending absolute poverty. Now, in the United States, there's more and more poverty, whereas in China, there's less and less poverty. I think that really reflects the priorities of the governments. But the reality is that, unfortunately, in the United States and in Western Europe, these are extremely hyper-capitalist societies, and the governments are controlled by large corporations and billionaire oligarchs. And that they see the Chinese economic model as a threat. They see socialism with Chinese characteristics and the Belt and Road Initiative as a threat to their corporations control over international markets. And that's why they're dedicated to trying to bring about regime change in China. There are a lot of average people who oppose these policies. They want to learn from the Chinese economic model and they want to have more economic democracy in, in our societies in the West. But unfortunately, we see that the economic model is so tightly mm -hmm. controlled by a small handful of these billionaire oligarch capitalists and economically speaking, there is basically no democracy, which of course makes it very difficult politically to have democracy. So I think that that's the, the fundamental crisis that we're in, those of us from the US, North America, or Western Europe. And I think in the decades to come, the challenge will be whether or not we can break out of this model of economic oligarchy, because all the signs show that the Chinese economic model is gonna continue to grow well, there's stagnation going on in the Western neoliberal economic model. Benjamin Norton, founder and editor of the independent news website Motor Polarista. Thank you so much for articulating many of those very important issues. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub. Thank you for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye. And take care.